Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. If not, please uh, let me know and I'll do my best to speak up or uh, adjust my microphone if need be. Um, so uh, as Susan mentioned, my name is Justin Miller. Uh, I'm one of the neuropsychologists here uh, in our center. Um, for those of you who were here at the Lunch and Learn that I did last time talking about what is neuropsychology, I, you'll have a, a good overview of what I, it is that I do. Um, but for those of you who weren't here, uh, my role here in our center is to help understand um, with a high degree of precision what people's cognitive abilities are and how those cognitive abilities might change uh, as people age. And when we talk about cognition, I'm referring to things like uh, the ability to pay attention, problem solving, language functioning, and most importantly, memory, which is what I'm going to focus on today. Um, a little bit of my background, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. I did my graduate work uh, at Wayne State University where I finished my doctorate. Um, I have previous training and experience in a rehab setting working with stroke, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury. I did my internship and advanced fellowship training in Los Angeles at UCLA uh, where I had a broad overview of uh, medical psychology, neuropsychology from a broad perspective. And, um, in my experiences throughout my training, I've come to really have an appreciation um, and interest both uh, clinically as well as academically in understanding more about neurodegenerative disease, uh, which is what brought me here to the Luruvo Center. Um, so uh, if you have questions for or like to know more about me or my background or what it is that I do here, I'd be happy to answer those questions. Just let me know at the end. Um, in addition, uh, I'm going to go through our slides uh, and kind of talk about uh, memory and learning and what memory really is. Um, and I'll save some time for questions at the end so that way we can make sure we get through the whole presentation and then uh, answer any questions you might have uh, as we go along. All right. Um, so to begin, when we talk about memory, Memory is one of those things that everybody has familiarity with. We all know and have some idea about what memory it is, what it means to remember things, what it means to forget things. Um, and it's one of the things that's often most worrisome about the aging process, when you become more forgetful, when things don't kind of stick the way that they used to. Um, and it's often quite worrisome. Memory is a really interesting thing, and it's actually a very complex uh, aspect of cognition that is much more simple, or I'm sorry, much more complex than just basic forgetfulness. There's a number of different kinds of memory. There's different brain structures that underlie the memory functions, and I'm going to talk about what those differences are, the different kinds of memory. Uh, and also talk a little bit about the processes involved that can affect your ability to learn and retain information. So in a broad sense, overall, memory is defined as the persistence of learning over time. It includes the ability to both store information as well as to retrieve the information uh, at a later point in time. A lot of times memory is compared to a computer system. So for example, if you create something on your computer, say a Word document, a letter, or a presentation, and you create the file, you put the information in, and then you hit save. It goes to the hard drive. It's there when you need it. You can come back to it later. You don't have to search for it. It's just right there. And it's easy to find, and it pulls back later. That's a pretty close parallel to the way that our own memory systems work. Unfortunately, though, a computer system is typically uh, a lot more efficient and much more stable in terms of its ability to retain the information um, than our own memory system is. Now, memory is a process, and there's multiple components to it, uh, and there's multiple steps to getting information both into the memory system as well as out at a later point in time. Um, I like to use an analogy of thinking about memory like a drawer or a bucket. The idea of normal memory functioning is you have your drawer, you open the drawer, you put the information in, you close the drawer. When you want the information later, you come back, open the drawer, there it is, and you pull it out and you have access to it. Well, there's a number of things that can go wrong in that process. What happens if your drawer doesn't have a bottom to it? 
and everything just falls out? Or what happens if your drawer is messy and you can't find anything in there? Or what happens if the drawer is stuck and you can't get it open? These are all parallels to some of the problems that can go wrong when you have trouble remembering things. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of those different aspects. So memory is a process that requires uh, multiple components. There's an encoding component, there's a storage component, there's a retrieval component, and there's a recognition component to it. The idea of memory encoding, this is sort of the first step. It's the ability to put information from the outside world into the memory system. It's getting the information in in the first place. So conceptually going back to our drawer, it's the process of putting the information or whatever you have into the drawer so that it's there in the first place. So now you've got the memory, it's in there. Storage is the ability to take that information to organize it in a way that it sticks and that it's there for access at a later point in time. The retrieval process is necessary in order to pull those information and those bits of information out from your memory at a later point in time. And this is so if somebody says to you, um, what was the name of that actor in the movie such and such? And you say, oh, it was so and so. That there is an example of retrieving. You're pulling the information out from your memory system. It's called free recall. And it just happens spontaneously and the information is there. There's also the, the process of recognition, which is a little bit of a, uh, a step removed from the retrieval process. Recognition is, um, for example, if you are walking through a crowd and you see a face of someone you recognize, like, oh, this person looks familiar. I know them. There's a, there's a signal, there's a cue that's been triggered that this is something that is familiar to you, whether that's a face you've seen, whether that's a name, something you've heard before. Um, the ability to recognize information is a component of memory. And recognition is actually something that is much, much easier than retrieval of information. And we'll talk about all of those differences uh, in a bit. So in terms of memory, I'll come back to the individual steps and processes involved in memory, but there's a lot of different types of memory. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the ideas of short-term memory, long-term memory, and I'll talk in a little bit about what some of those distinctions are, but when we think about long-term memory, there's actually a number of different subcomponents underneath that aspect. Broadly defined, we have what are called explicit memories and implicit memories. Explicit memories are things like knowledge, these are facts, these are things you've experienced or events. These are things where you were to say, if you were to say, oh, I remember when, or such and such his name is, this is the ability to state facts, to declare or express something, a bit of knowledge that you have previously acquired. Things like your social security number, or your birthday, or where you were born. These are all aspects and facts of declarative memory. Implicit memory, on the other hand, is a type of memory and learning that is something that happens without the ability, you're not actively recalling anything. This is things like skills and things that you've learned. So for a great example of this is tying your shoes. Learning how to tie your shoes and remembering how to tie your shoes, you don't say, this is how I tie my shoe, unless you're explicitly explaining it to somebody. But you know, if you go to tie your shoe, you know how to do it. Riding a bike is another example of a skill or a process that you've learned. If you play sports, um, swinging a golf club is a type of skill that you've learned. And these are things that are an implicit memory. It's a process or a skill or behavior that you've learned and acquired. Same concept of memory but it's a little bit different. It doesn't, recall, it doesn't require the explicit declaration of knowledge. Now, when we think about short-term memory and long-term memory, the things that most people get concerned about are more of the explicit memories. Trouble remembering facts, trouble remembering places they've been or things they've done or things they've experienced. Um, it's not very often that people report, I forgot how to ride my bike or I've forgotten how to tie my shoes, although it does happen. Now, why this is important is because these two memory systems re rely or are related to different parts of the brain. And I'll come back into more detail about what some of those distinctions are with each of those systems. 
So I've talked a little bit about implicit memory and explicit memory and kind of gone through some of these things in detail already. Um, but essentially, the, the main difference is if you think about information which you're trying to state something out loud or recall, recalling a fact is an explicit memory versus remembering a skill or how to do something is more of a, an implicit or procedural memory. There's a few other different types of memory functioning um, to think about with regard to the types of information and the different processes that go into it. Sensory memory is something that most people aren't really aware of. It's not something that we readily think about. But sensory memory is the uh, act of essentially taking in all of the information, the incoming sensory information that's within my awareness, both in terms of vision, sense of smell, sense of hearing, sense of touch, sense of feel. If you think about that for just a split second, there's a vast amount of information coming at us at any given moment. There's, you've got the temperature of the room, you've got the pressure of the seat against your legs, you've got uh, the lights coming from above, you've got my voice coming at you, you've got perhaps somebody next to you chewing their gum, you've got the thought processes going on in your mind, you've got all of the bits of information that are visually coming at you. There's a tremendous volume of information. Now, if we, research has shown that this memory, this sensory memory lasts on the magnitude of about milliseconds. If you don't pay attention to that information, it's gone. And that's actually a good thing, which I'll explain in just a second. Um, but um, if you, the, the distinction with sensory memory, so what happens, how does information get transferred from your sensory memory into short-term memory? I'll explain in just a second, but we'll talk about short-term memory, which is actually one of the biggest concerns that people have. People often state that I have my short-term memory just isn't what it used to be. Information comes in and I lose it at the drop of a hat or I have trouble remembering things that we talked about 10 minutes ago. Short-term memory is one of the earliest and most sensitive and vulnerable aspects of the memory system to normal aging as well as uh, aging and abnormal aging in terms of things like Alzheimer's disease and some of the other dementias. And I'll talk explicitly about that um, shortly. Um, so short-term memory in a nutshell is all of the information that you're hearing things that we're talking about right now, perhaps things that you heard or talked about or experienced just a few moments ago, your, your um, experience of traveling from home to the center, what you had for breakfast, these are all examples of short-term memory, things that have very recently been experienced. Your short-term memory has a very limited capacity. It is not infinite, it has a certain ability to hold some information, but there's kind of it's kind of like a glass. It gets to a point where the short-term memory capacity is exceeded. And research has actually shown that you are able to hold about seven bits of information. The average person can hold about seven bits of information in their short-term memory. What is the what are those bits of information? <laughs> It, it could be any number of things. Um, if I were to read to you a series of numbers, for example, <coughs> chances are that most of you would probably be able to, on average, recall about five to nine of those numbers if I read to you, say, 25 different numbers. If I read them to you one at a time. So if I said four, seven, seven, three, seven, nine, eight, you know, you might remember some of those. Now if I said to you, 47, 37, 24, same amount of numbers. They're not exactly the same numbers, uh, but same amount of numbers, but now they've been grouped, they've been chunked. So that 47 is the same unit of information as if I just said four. So we can facilitate our short-term memory by presenting information in chunks like that. But the, the basic premise is the same, that everybody can hold about seven, give or take two. And that's pretty normal. But it, as we get older, that system becomes less efficient <coughs> and is one of the most difficult things for people to, um, that are most worrisome aspects of the aging process when short-term memory feels like it's not as efficient as it used to be. 
Um, working memory is very closely related to short-term memory. Working memory is the ability to take information and work with it in real time. So for example, if you're trying to do mental arithmetic, is a great example of working memory. Thinking about, okay, eight plus four is 12. That skill, and to be able to work with that information in your mind without writing it down, that's working memory. That's the ability to use the information, to manipulate the information in real time. Um, Long-term memory, on the other hand, this is what people often think about um, as like memories from childhood, things you learned in school, things that happened a long time ago. Long-term memory is relatively permanent, uh, and insofar as we can tell, it's limitless in its capacity. We have no way to know how large or how much information someone can hold in their long-term memory. It's, it, it would be impossible for us to really study this effectively because, for example, how many times have you had the experience where all of a sudden, 20 years after an event occurred, you run into an old friend and they say to you, remember such and such, and you're like, oh my gosh, I remember it like it was yesterday, but I haven't thought about that in years. How do I, how, if I were to try and evaluate that, well, tell me all, everything that happened, all the important moments from your life. <laughs> you, you're not going to be able to do it. Chances are somebody's going to say something like, oh, that's right, I forgot about that one. Oh, and I forgot about this one too. So unless I have a way, unless I know you really, really well and can elicit every single thing you've ever experienced, I'm not going to be able to measure how much capacity your long-term memory has. Um, it's also why things that are uh, relatively familiar or highly experienced or salient information or really significant things, they stay with you. Things like your birthday, things from childhood, you know, very memorable moments in your life are things that stay with you for a long period of time. Um, and you know, this is something that stays relatively preserved throughout the aging process. Prospective memory is another kind of memory um, and this is something that I th I'm sure that every person in this room could be able to, ex it has experienced a failure of prospective memory. Prospective memory is when you trying to remember to do something in the future. How many of you have ever walked into a room and you're like, now why the heck am I here? <laughs> every, it happens to everybody. And I mean, it, it happens like relatively early in life. It's actually a very, um, complex aspect of memory and to be honest it's relatively poorly understood in comparison to some of the other aspects of memory. We don't truly know all of the details and all of the underlying systems and uh, neuroanatomy related to remembering to do something in the future. One of the reasons is it's really hard for us to study in a systematic and reliable way. Um, but you know prospective memory is one of those things that happens to everybody and it's very frustrating. The good news is, is that it's a relatively normal phenomenon. It gets concerning if it starts to happen all the time, more so than other people your age, but chances are people are often worried about it. Uh, they come into my clinic and they tell me, I, I go into a room, I open their fridge, and I have no idea what the heck I'm looking for. And I say, well, why don't you go home, ask your friends if they have that experience. And oh, they, they, they do too, everybody does. So um, those are just a, a few of the major different aspects of memory. And I'm sure that uh, this is something that uh, may have been familiar to you, but I, it may also have been kind of a surprise to know that there's so many different kinds of memory. And it's, more com it's much, more, much, much more complex than just where you went to school when you grew up, things that you had for breakfast. It's, it's a lot more complicated than that. So, this here on the screen at the top is a very simplified model of memory, right? If we think about all of these external events, right? This is everything that's happening in the world around you. All of the information, things that are going on, um, and this is all sensory input that's coming at you. The good news is, is that you don't attend or pay attention to about 99% of it which I assure you is a good thing, because if you did, you would be so overwhelmed with information and so flooded with input that you wouldn't be able to effectively function. 
You know, so for example, if I pointed out to you that my tie is plaid with green and blue, now you're paying attention to that. Whereas 30 seconds ago, you may not have even noticed or paid attention to that. But it's still there. The information is still coming at you. But until you pay attention to it, the information is lost, right? Sensory information, it registers everything that comes in and it's gone within a flash. Uh, again, it's a vast amount of information. Then what happens is if you pay attention to something, now all of a sudden your attention, it's like a spotlight. And if you think about all of the information, I'm going to narrow the spotlight in. If we go back to my tie, the spotlight is now narrowed on the tie. Right? All of a sudden now that information is encoded. You're paying attention to it. And so this information goes into your short-term memory because you've paid attention to it. Now that information is available to use in your short-term memory, in the working memory if you need to do it. So for example, if you wanted to remember a phone number, you hear it on TV, that information has been attended to, it's in your short-term memory, and now you have to try and remember it before you get to the phone so you can dial it, right? You're using your working memory skills right there in that moment. You're saying, okay, 217-4835, 217-4835, in order to remember it. That's an example of working memory. You get to the phone and you retrieve the information and all is good. But then, if you don't write the number down, it's gone, right? So that's short-term memory. Now, we can continue to work with that information and to transfer the information from our short-term memory into our long-term memory, that's the process where we consolidate information, where we encode the information into our long-term memory. There's a number of different ways that we can accomplish this. Um, rehearsal is a classic example. So for example, trying to memorize lines in a play. This is something where you have your lines, you're trying to memorize them, and this is something you rehearse it, you go over it, over and over and over again until the information sticks. This is a very classic approach to things you may have done in school, studying for an exam or studying for a, uh, a test or a project or uh, any type of thing where you need to learn new information and then use it at a later point in time. Rehearsal is one of the most common things that people do. Unfortunately, it's not really the most efficient way to learn information. Um, it works, but it's very labor intensive uh, and it's not really uh, as quick as if some of the other strategies. Now, another example is in terms of processing and in depth of processing. So for example, if I were to try and teach you um, how to create uh, or work in, say, a chemistry lab, and I'm trying to teach you how to balance equations. This is something that I could teach you. It's a skill. It's math-based. You do it over and over again, and you just repeat the information and you learn it. But if I were to try and explain to you uh, um, the theoretical model underneath it, where now you're processing the information in a deeper way, you're thinking about it in a more complex way than you had before, than just trying to memorize it, that depth of processing, the more complex your thought processes are related to the information, the more likely you are to learn it and to remember it. Another, a great example of this is if you're trying to learn a new skill. So you, you learn it and then you practice it. You learn it and then you practice it. You implement it, for example. Um, another thing that actually is really interesting with memory, there's a very, very strong relationship between your emotional experiences and memory. And there's um, a, an anatomical explanation for this in terms of the parts of the brain that are associated with this. But um, this is something that we refer to as a flashbulb memory, which I'll talk about in just a second. But really what happens is if there is some form, of, some event happens that is somehow attached to a very significant emotional feeling, that information is encoded and stored almost instantly in exquisite detail. Great examples of this are remembering where you were, what you were doing, what you were wearing when you heard of the JFK assassination or on September 11th. These emotionally charged, very powerful events that create a rise in your emotional reactivity facilitate learning new information. And I bet you that most of you have memories like this, like I remember exactly what I was doing when such and such happened. This is called flashbulb memory. Because those emotions are so strongly attached to that information and there is such this reaction within you on an emotional level, it 
directly facilitates learning that information. So with regard to this memory model, if we assume that there is normal brain functioning, and we assume that if you're given an adequate cue at a later point in time, you're going to be able to get that information out. So in going back to our drawer example, the idea of encoding would be like putting the information into the drawer. right? The idea of retrieving is getting the information back out. Now, sometimes what can happen um, is the memory system doesn't work as well or as we had hoped that it should. Um, I've talked a little bit about some of the short-term memory, long-term memory, consolidation and the different processes here, um, just to give you a little bit more information. Um, and if we go back to our memory model, I'm sorry, I'm skipping around a bit. If we go back to our memory model for just a second, and thinking about the ways that memory can go wrong, how many of you have had the experience where you can't remember something or somebody says to you, well, remember we already talked about such and such, and it's like, oh, that's right, we did, and it pops right back. They give you that clue, that hint, that reminder, and it's like, oh, that's right, I did remember that. And the information is there, you just couldn't get to it as easily, right? That's an example of what might happen if your memory drawer is stuck, closed, that you need some help to get it back open. Another example is if the information is in there and it's kind of like the junk drawer at your house, which I'm sure everybody's got a junk drawer. It's just filled with stuff. There's no organization. I mean, finding something in your junk drawer, you've got to dig around and it's really hard. Without that organization, your memory is like the same, is, is kind of the same thing. If you don't have the information, you can't get to it as easily, you can't find it, it's not organized very well, it's harder to pull the information out. But if somebody says to you, look, it's over there, it's like right there, you can pull it out really easily. Um, the other kind of problem that can go wrong with the memory system uh, is if in the encoding stage. Okay? This would be like if your drawer had no bottom to it. No matter how much information you put in there, no matter how many times you put the information in, it just doesn't stick because it falls right out the bottom. No matter how many times you open that drawer later on, the information, there's nothing there. There's nothing to retrieve the information. The thing that, the experience of both of those though at a surface level is the same. You don't remember the information. It's like, I forget, I didn't do that, or I, I don't remember that. But the difference is, is whether or not the information is there for you to remember, you just can't get to it, or whether or not it was gone and never stored in the first place. And those two types of memory problems are very different. They rely on different brain structures, and in, in my role here in our clinic, it helps me understand a little bit more about what's going on inside the brain and what types of disease processes might be going on if, that's, uh, if there's an abnormal experience of forgetting. Um, so there's a few, and I have a couple pictures of this in, in just a few minutes, or the, actually the next slides, which will explain and show a little bit more detail about where these different brain structures are. Now the good news is that there isn't really a memory spot in the brain. You don't have, it's not like, a, like your heart, which is responsible for pumping your blood. If your heart goes, then there's nothing else to pump blood, right? In your brain, we don't have a memory spot. There's not one particular thing that is only the only thing responsible for memory. It's a circuit. There's a number of different components to it. There's some that are more important than others, but there is no one individual part of the brain that's responsible for memory, and that's the only thing it does and the only one that does it. It wouldn't be a very good design to, to have a, a system like that. You know, when I, um, one example is that your, your brain is composed of lots of individual neurons, right? If you had a memory, if each neuron was associated with a memory, so one neuron for one memory, that's not a good idea because then what happens if that neuron dies? Does the memory then go with it? Like if you had like a grandmother cell and all of a sudden the grandmother cell dies, does grandma go with it? No, fortunately, it doesn't work like that. Um, so one of the main components in the memory system is the hippocampus. This is a structure in the side of the brain, which I'll, I'll show you on a diagram in just a second. It's a part of what's called the limbic system. And the hippocampus 
is a part of the brain that is very heavily involved and associated with explicit memories, which again are those memories of facts, of figures, of information, knowledge, and things that you've acquired over time. This is the ability to say, I remember when, or uh, I know such and such. This is the hippocampi's main function. It's also really involved in short-term memory and being able to uh, encode that information into the long-term memory and consolidate information into those long-term memory stores. Um, there's a number of different diseases and um, accidents, injuries, illnesses that can influence the hippocampus. Uh, and depending on where and what part of the hippocampus is damaged can lead to very, certain, very specific kinds of memory problems. Um, another part of the memory, another important brain structure and memory system is what's called the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. And I've, I've got pictures of this as well. Um, this is more involved in those implicit memories, the procedures, the skills, and the things that you've learned. It's a very closely related, but it's a separate memory system from the hippocampus system. The amygdala is part of the, uh, also part of the, the limbic system. Um, and the amygdala, it sits right on top of the hippocampus. The amygdala is what's responsible and very heavily associated with memory, I'm sorry, with emotions and your experience of emotions and processing of emotions. And so remember when I was talking about flashbulb memories that the ability that a really highly emotional event facilitates memory? This is why, it's because what happens is, is you get the amygdala activated, which is because it's right next to the hippocampus, it facilitates and helps the hippocampus encode those new memories, right? There's also the frontal lobes, which are the main parts of the brain in the front. Um, these are really important for being able to organize information effectively, to search for information within the memory system, and to kind of pull that information out at a later point in time. All of these different brain parts work together to give you the experience of remembering information, remembering skills, and learning new things. So if we look at this is a, a, a diagram of the explicit memory system. There's a number of different parts on here. The main ones to really uh, point out are the hippocampus and the amygdala, which are down on the bottom. And as you can see, these are deep within the middle parts of the brain. And you actually, all of these structures, you have two of them. You have one on the left and one on the right, uh, which is also good in case something goes wrong with one of them, the whole memory system doesn't go down with it. Um, in terms of the basal ganglia, which is responsible for those implicit memories, your skills, learning new tasks, learning new behaviors and things like this, these are also structures which are very closely related to the hippocampus and sit basically next to them. But these are also um, located within the center of the brain and represent a different memory system. And the frontal lobes are the part out here in the front, which again are responsible for uh, the organization of information, the retrieval, the ability to search for information, and using strategies to effectively pull information out later. So why do we forget? There's a lot of different things that can go wrong in the memory process. Uh, I've talked a little bit about what happens like using our drawer as an example. And one of the biggest, most concerning things that I see, or most frequent things that I see, is a, a problem in the encoding process. This is where information never makes it into the memory system in the first place. It's again as if the, the drawer has fallen out, or the bottom of the drawer has fallen out. Poor encoding can happen for a number of reasons. If we assume that there's normal brain functioning, the brain is functioning as it should, poor encoding can happen if you don't pay attention. It's a, a great example is, is you and, and your significant other or a family member are having a conversation and they're talking to you about one thing and all of a sudden a thought pops into your mind and you start thinking, oh, that's right, I gotta go to the grocery store. And then they're like, hey, you remember that? You're like, uh, no, because you didn't pay attention to it. If you don't pay attention to it, you can't remember it later on, right? Things like depression, anxiety, stress, worry, these are all things that can influence the attention system. 
Uh, and if you can't pay attention to something or you have a hard time paying attention to things, it's going to be hard to remember the information later because you never paid attention to it. Um, there's also the ideas of interference, which are, is information that interferes with your ability to retrieve or learn information. There's a couple different kinds of interference. There's what we call proactive interference, which is where um, information that I've learned or just recently learned gets in the way of me being able to access new information. So a good example of this is if you are at a group, you're, you're with a group of friends and you just met a bunch of new people and these are really great, really exciting people and you're like, oh, this is such and such and you go and you meet one of your older friends and for a split second you blank out what is this person's name? I've known this person for years. Oh my gosh, I can't think of their name. It's because you've just learned a whole bunch of new names and that new learning is getting in the way of getting to those old memories. That's one kind of trouble. And that's experience like forgetting. The information's there, it's just not getting to it as effectively. There's also another kind of um, interference which is called retroactive interference, um, which is kind of the same thing as proactive interference, it's just in a different direction. But the, uh, the idea is basically new information is interfering with old information uh, and your ability to get to it as easily. But both are experienced as forgetfulness. Okay? Now, for a while it was thought that there was the idea of decay, that memories would decay and erode and kind of disappear and fade over time. There is not any real good research evidence to support that this is true. Um, again, going back to the discussion earlier where the memory system is essentially limitless. We don't know how much information the memory system can hold. And I have no way to estimate information that's been lost. Has it been lost for good or has it just been buried? And perhaps if you got a clue or a hint, it's there later. You know, a, a great examples of these are memories and things that you experienced in childhood or young adulthood that maybe you haven't thought about in many, many years and then something triggers that memory at, at a later point in time. So the idea of memories decaying and fading over time isn't really well supported by research. There's also the idea of repression, uh, which is a relatively outdated theory that the idea is that memories kind of get buried deep and down, they get pushed down and we don't ignore them and that they can be spontaneously recovered perhaps in therapy where you start talking and all of a sudden you, this flood of memories comes back to you about things that you've forgotten, maybe traumatic events or things that you tried to forget and there's not a really good or robust literature base to support the idea of repression either. Um, but there are some case control studies of this that suggest that it does happen, um, but it seems to be a relatively rare individual phenomenon. So in terms of, um, I'm realizing I'm running out of time and I want to make sure I leave room for questions, but um, in terms of abnormal forgetting, so I'll talk really quickly about the different kinds of diseases that can affect memory. One of the most common that everybody is familiar with is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a uh, neurodegenerative disease that most people prominently associate with forgetfulness and problems with memory, which is very true. Um, and one of the reasons why that is the case is because Alzheimer's disease, for reasons that kind of escape us at the moment, uh, seems to affect the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, again, is that memory system that's involved in those explicit memories, development of those short-term memories. Uh, so if the hippocampus doesn't work the way that it should, it's kind of like the information is falling out of the bottom of your drawer because the information isn't getting stored, right? Um, Alzheimer's disease typically begins with minor forgetfulness. A lot of times it gets mistaken as normal aging. Um, and a lot of times it is normal aging. Um, but the, the, the difference between Alzheimer's disease is when it happens more rapidly than we would expect for a normal aging process, uh, or if it starts to interfere with someone's ability to function on a daily basis, that's when we start to get concerned about uh, abnormal or unusual forgetting. The important thing to remember is that changes in thinking and memory uh, are a normal part of the aging process. It happens to everybody. Um, 
The difference is that for some people it happens sooner than other people. For some people it happens more quickly than other people. That's when we start to get worried that there's something unusual going on. Um, one of the interesting things about Alzheimer's disease, if you remember back to my discussion about the explicit versus implicit memory and those skills and behaviors, um, implicit memory, the ability to remember how to do tasks, how to learn new skills, is relatively preserved in Alzheimer's disease. And why is that? It's a different memory system. It's not the same structures. Those implicit memories, those skills, those behaviors don't rely on the same hippocampal systems as the ability to recall facts and learn new information. This is an example, a, a, a picture of what some of the changes in Alzheimer's disease look like. So this on the, on the left here, I'll focus on the main parts, but on the left here, uh, this is what a normal healthy hippocampus looks like. And you can see it's deep down in the middle parts of the brain. In Alzheimer's disease, the hippocampus shrinks severely and leaves a gap here. And again, that's going to cause those problems and those difficulties with explicit memories and being able to recall and retrieve those information and those new facts later on. A different example of, of memory problems is, is seen in Parkinson's disease. Um, Parkinson's disease is typically associated with motor problems, tremors and shakiness and trouble walking. Some people with Parkinson's disease will also develop problems with memory and thinking. It's a very different kind of memory problem though. Um, whereas in Alzheimer's disease, the, the problems with memory and the difficulties with learning and retrieving new information is, is a problem of encoding, in other words, getting information into the memory system. In Parkinson's disease, it's more of a problem of getting information out, okay? It's as if that drawer is stuck closed or it's not organized very well. And this is also because it's affecting a different part of the brain than what we see is affected in Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't influence the hippocampus in the same way that Alzheimer's disease does. Um, so I, that's a really quick run through of the two, of two examples of diseases where memory can go wrong. We've talked a little bit about um, some of the normal processes and why we forget information. Uh, I hope that you have a different understanding to realize that memory is much more complex than uh, what many people just think. It's not just I forget. There's a lot of different kinds of memory. There's different memory systems. There's different memory processes. So when I have somebody who comes into my clinic and they say, well, I can't remember things that, like I should. That's true. That's their experience. But what I want to know is I want to know, well, why? Is it you can't remember the information? You just can't retrieve it? Is the information lost and never there? And this is helpful because so this is why I'm going to ask questions uh, to help me understand about how the memory system has gone wrong, which will give me clues to what parts of the brain might be affected. And then we can follow that up with different tests to know uh, with much greater detail about some of the difficulties that somebody might be having. Um, I have not left a tremendous amount of time for uh, questions, but uh, if anybody has questions, please. Um, you just said that you do tests to see if there's something, what's going wrong there. Uh -huh. Is there anything you can do about it? So the, the question is um, regards to um, whether or not there's anything you can do about memory. You know? And you are correct. We, we are able to administer tests to help us know about what the problem with memory is. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what can you do about it, there's a number of different things that you can do. Um, it depends on the kind of problem that you have. Uh, so, for example, if the problem is getting information into the memory system, trouble encoding the information and learning the information, this could be facilitated by using things like notes, written reminders, uh, practicing taking out skills, active listening, processing the information more deeply. There's a number of different things that you can do. Uh, if it's a problem where the information, um, you're having a hard time keeping the information organized. So as an example, if you create a shopping list for yourself and you say, I need eggs, I need milk, I need flour, I need sugar. These are all the things like, it's going to be hard for you to remember. It's a list. But then if you say, okay, I am baking a cake. 
All of a sudden now you've created an organizational framework that's going to help the information be organized more uh, effectively and it's going to be easier to kind of search because now you've got that structure, right? So there's strategies that you can learn like that. Um, the, so the short answer is yes, there are things that you can do. The, the question is really a matter of what has gone wrong with the memory process that's leading to the experience of forgetfulness. What would you do with the empty bottomless drawer? So if I had a problem where the information isn't getting into the memory system, I would rely on things like notes and reminders using my calendar. No, the bottomless drawer, the other end. Where it falls out the bottom? Yeah. Right. That the, so because the information isn't sticking, it's not staying in the memory system, you want to rely on something else to help it stay there, like a note or a reminder. So you write it down so that the information is there later. Right? Yes. No, I'm just thinking more in terms of long-term memory. In term? Disappears. Uh, you know, well, so long-term memory is generally something that sticks around. It doesn't really have, uh, again, long-term memory is, though, is relatively limitless, and it's hard for us to know um, how much information is lost. So I guess um, we don't really have any good strategies because long-term memory isn't something that's really effective um, for most individuals as part of the normal aging process. Yes? Sure. The, the, the question is, is what the difference is between Alzheimer's and dementia? And that's a really great question, actually, because I get that a lot. Um, dementia is a very broad term. It's an overview uh, or an umbrella term that we use to describe somebody who has problems in thinking and problems with daily functioning. Alzheimer's disease is a kind or a type of dementia. It's not the only type of dementia. So an example or an analogy is cancer. If I said to you, uh, such and such has cancer, that's a very broad term. There's a lot of different kinds of cancer. Dementia is the same way. Dementia is the broad umbrella term, and there's a lot of different kinds of dementia. And Alzheimer's disease is one example. Um, there's also frontal temporal dementia, there's dementia with Lewy bodies, there's um, Parkinson's disease dementia, there's a lot of different kinds of dementia and Alzheimer's disease is just one type. We have a question in front. Sure. Hello, my name is Virginia. Recently I read an article on um, early young set dementia. And it had to do with um, Parkinson's disease and genetic testing. Uh, that there's a genetic gene factor. If the parent was German descent and had Parkinson's, the gene can be in someone and you can test for it and it proves they have early dementia. Have you read up on this? Um, so I think so. I think the question is, um, if I'm able to kind of simplify a little bit, is, is there a genetic component or a genetic test that can be run uh, for dementia? Um, there is uh, there is definitely evidence to suggest that there is a genetic component to uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, uh, most of the dementia syndromes. We do have evidence to suggest that there is uh, a genetic component. And in regard to the early onset dementias, there is evidence to suge suggest that there is a stronger genetic component um, to individuals who develop Alzheimer's or dementia at an earlier point in their life than uh, others. In regard to whether or not there's um, different uh, prevalence or risk associated with certain um, cultures or ethnic groups, like for example, in, in Germans or um, other, other uh, ethnicities, I don't know if there's any specific group that's been identified as at higher risk, um, but certainly there are genetic components and there are certainly different genes present in different populations of individuals. So I'm not going to say that it's not possible, but at the same time, uh, I'm not 
thoroughly convinced that there's a, a tremendous amount of evidence for a particular ethnic group being more vulnerable than others. Uh, but certainly there is a genetic component to it. Thank you. Yes. Um, you had said that there is not uh, robust evidence to support repression of memories. What does that do to the whole notion that um, an adult remembers uh, being sexually abused as a child and it suddenly comes to the surface? Is that suspect or what, how do you approach it? So uh, the question is, is what in, in regard to the idea of repression of memories and whether or not and how that might influence or interplay with what we know to be the case for individuals who have experienced abuse uh, during childhood, who later recover those memories at a later point in time. Um, my, I don't think by any means that it debunks or discredits those experiences by any means. Again, um, when we look at the larger body of scientific evidence, there doesn't seem to be a huge proportion of people who experience that, but it does happen for some individuals. Uh, and particularly where we know that it seems to be happening more often is in cases where there is trauma and there it does seem to be active um, forgetting, for example. Uh, it, and it happens beyond just experiences of abuse. It's also been reported to occur in, in things like PTSD and, and combat exposure and military exposure. Um, but the flip side is also true where um, a lot of people develop those flashbulb memories where the experience is so tragic and so horrific that the, the information is remembered in exquisite detail, much more so than would be desirable. So to answer your question, I don't think that um, it really debunks or, or challenges or questions that phenomena. It's just not uh, as widespread a, as an experience as we once thought. OK, I have time for one more question. That's a good question. Um, so the, so um, the question is, in how does chemotherapy uh, affect memory in particular? The short answer um, is it depends. Um, there is a literature that is relatively robust to show that some individuals who undergo chemotherapy uh, experience cognitive effects later in life. Um, there's a number of different factors that contribute to those, uh, to those experiences and those problems. Um, it is related to the chemotherapy agents that were used. It was related to the type of cancer. It's related to whether or not there was any adjuvant therapies. For example, one of the most widely studied is in breast cancer uh, and whether or not there's been um, additional use of adjuvant hormone therapy. Um, it also is influenced by whether or not there was radiation involved, if it was whole brain radiation, or if the radiation targeted the brain, uh, or whole body radiation. Uh, so the short answer is that it, it does occur. Uh, it depends on uh, a lot of individual variables and factors as to whether or not somebody might experience some of those difficulties. Um, and it's... it's um, there's not enough for us to be able to say, like, this happens to every person who experiences is chemotherapy. Um, we don't have that level of specificity with it. Well, Justin Miller, thank you so thank much you. for all of your